willing to do that with us, you know, let's explore what makes our youth angry, what makes, what causes friction between us and, you know, youths, you know, youths like me and, and our parents, you know, <laughs> what causes friction. So um, I'm going to start uh, introducing them. Um, my young lady, Tomi Bikunle, she's currently a junior at Berry College in Rome, Georgia. She's a double major pursuing a biochemistry and engineering degree. She intends to go to medical school after graduation and is interested in becoming OB, OBGYN. She enjoys reading in her free time and she has recently picked up dancing Woo -hoo! as a hobby. <laughs> she tries to live by a quote from Lewis Carroll that says, it's no use going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you, Tommy. Have you, there? you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. So the next person is my young person, Joshua Hambolu. Joshua is originally from Nigeria. He's lived in many countries around the world though. He's a first year computer science major at Georgia State University in downtown Atlanta. He's looking to transfer at some point, you know, down the line. Um, following graduation, he hopes to work in the technical field, especially and specifically for a Fortune 500 company. Go, Josh. Uh, please put Hello, your hands up and welcome Josh for me. We're glad to have you this afternoon. My next guest, wow, is the one and only Nike Aremo. <laughs> she's a blogger, she's a mom, she's a writer, she's a speaker. You know, I said, wow, because she's a woman of many parts, you know. Um, she's the published author of three books. She has a unique style of using her real life stories to bring comfort and peace to her readers. She's, she's dealt with some grief, you know, and she's using that to reach out to people, to encourage people, you know, like basically take her life lessons and share, you know, with others, you know. She has a bachelor's degree in English and literary studies. She happens to be, okay, disclosure, she happens to be from my alma mater. Good, great, Ife. <laughs> you know, apologies to those who went to one of the other universities in Nigeria, as we say. <laughs> so <laughs> Nika started, she also has a certificate in technical writing. Nika started her career as a high school teacher and later moved into the corporate world of software development. She opened, uh, she owns and operates a home care agency and runs a sickle cell foundation. She's a native, she's native born of Nigeria, but then she was born in London <laughs> and she grew up in the UK as well as in Nigeria. She lives in Jones Creek, Georgia with her husband and best friend Kola. They are parents of two young adults, Toby and Tolu, who keep them forever young. Um, she, you can follow her on Instagram at nike.aremu or you can visit her website at thenikearemu.com. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Nike Aremu. We're glad to have you, Nike. The Thanks. next person is Dr. Ngozi Ojoke. She's a board certified pulmonary critical care and uh, internal medicine physician. She's a highly sought after clinician and administrator with a vast experience in healthcare startup and turning around distressed hospitals. Um, she has served as part-time faculty with graduate medical education, internal medicine re residency program in Atlanta, Georgia. She's a member of the American Thoracic Society and a fellow of American College of Chest Physicians. She's the proud mother of be five beautiful children who have truly motivated and continually inspire her to be better daily. She's a practicing Christian and she attributes her successes to the loving favor and grace of Jesus Christ. And in addition, uh, Dr. Ongozi is a uh, member of the board of directors for parenting resources and initiatives. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ongozi. Um, as I said at the start, for some of you that may be wondering, she's currently in the hospital, um, you know, she's on duty, but she, she has this window, we're hoping that that window remains open in the of this, of this meeting and she doesn't, get, she doesn't get called for something urgent. 
the next person is um, Mr. Peter D. Richardson. Um, he's a dynamic orator with a passion for community outreach and social service programs. Um, young couples and young families are, are his passion. He works at More Than Conquerors, which, is, which teaches abstinence and purity in school systems, obstetrics offices, and the community. He also coordinates the Newton County Juvenile Courts Reach Program and uh, for first-time juvenile offenders, and he has worked as the site coordinator for um, MELD Young Dads and Young Couples, Young Families, and the Nurturing Fathers programs in Rockdale, Newton, and DeKalb counties for several years. Um, he's, he's a devoted husband to Dr. Valora and father to two beautiful daughters. He's an ordained elder and certified teacher and trainer for the Franklin Covey's Seven Habits for Highly Effective Teens. He recently completed a certification as facilitator with the Prepare Enrich Premarital and Marriage Enrichment Program. Please put your hands together and welcome with me, Mr. Richardson, Elder Richardson. <laughs> and last but not the least, is somebody you all know, well, most of you will know if you have been with us mm -hmm. on our journey this year, and is no other person than Anthony Lawrence Lewis. He attended undergrad at Pace University in New York, graduating magna cum laude in 1989 with a degree in marketing and another in psychology. He began graduate studies at New York University in 1990 and was awarded his master's in philosophy. I'm trying to cut this short. He has a lengthy bio. So Anthony, pardon me, there's no way I can read through everything here. Two years later, he graduated from Cornell Law School. But you know, I just want you all to know that he's, a, he's an accomplished man. You know, but whether I cut it short or not does not diminish from his accomplishments. From 1995 to 1998, he worked as an assistant DA at the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. In October of 1998, he and his wife relocated to Atlanta, where he spent 16 months at the Fulton County District Attorney's Office before opening his own law practice. In July 2020, he and his wife celebrated their 29th wedding anniversary. Awesome. They have been blessed with two boys, Alexander and Andrew. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Anthony Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you for joining us, everyone. Um, we're glad to have you on the call. And we hope that um, you will stay with us till the end. We hope that um, you will share your entire evening with us. Again, our young people are the focus. Um, in addition to be a member of the panel, Dr. Ngozi would also kind of moderate for us, you know, um, kind, kind of uh, serving as, you know, a bridge between the youths and the other panelists. So I'm going to turn it over to her and, um, you know, she can go from there. Dr. Ngozi, over to you. All right, um, uh, Ms. Bola, thank you so much for that. I hope you guys can hear me because with the mask, it's a little uh, muffled and I do appreciate that. And there will be some background noise, but please just forgive, forgive that because it's still the hospital. So the basic way we're gonna do this today is um, there are questions that the, the youth panelists have kind of um, generated. And again, like um, Ms. Odito Kunz told us, it's not their, necessarily their own questions, they're questions that they've kind of grouped together. And so um, without any, I, um, any more waste in terms of our time or let's start up with the first question. So um, Josh, if you wanna take the first question and just um, open us with a question and then we'll kind of take, we're gonna do it as a question and answer session. And um, I think it will be more fruitful in terms of our time that way and also in terms of um, people asking questions. Those of you that are not on the panel, um, if you just um, go ahead and um, put your questions in the chat box um, um, one of the PRI um, um, people uh, will kind of pull up those questions. And if there are any questions we're unable to get to by the end of this session, um, we will definitely reach out to you via email and um, get some of those questions answered for you too. So Josh, if you're ready with the first question, please. Actually, actually um, thank you for that, but tell me questions is first. So we'll start with Tommy. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, Tommy's question is, is, is going to start us off. I, I feel like her okay, question so first is, one, okay. is a great right, introduction. Tommy. Okay, so Tommy, if you want to go ahead and start out for us. 
Um, hello, thank you again for coming. Um, so I'm gonna, the first question I would like to ask, us, ask the parent panelists today will be, why does our generation feel this feel so disconnected from yours? And why does it feel like we have to be extremely sneaky with you? And for example, we have this mentality of, it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And for, again, another example, if let's say you wanna go get a tattoo, I, someone's going to go get a tattoo and come back home and at that point he's already done is best, best to just say sorry after after all that and why do you feel like that's the case and how do we address that i'm going to start if um mrs arebu if you don't mind um answering that question for us i'm just going to randomly pick people and so the first thing i also want to say is that um a lot of these questions and um that you're asking also generalities all right it's it's not the case for every family and i use my son as an example i'm not a tattoo advocate i actually detest i have a visceral revulsion for anything that marks anyone's body so i don't believe in cutting healthy tissue but um before my son went to get a tattoo he did actually have a conversation with me he understood how i felt about it but we did uh, agree upon certain things so um, again, we have to remember that some of these questions are generalities, and so we're going to answer them to the best of our knowledge from our experience as parents, okay? Um, so, Mrs. Aremu, would you like to kind of take us through that particular question, and then we'll, um, we'll sure. go ahead and, uh, yeah. So, the question is, why do you feel you have to be sneaky around our generation, and the specific example is regarding tattoos, correct? I, I thought I thought the question. Hold on. I thought the question was the disconnect between the two generations. I, I think that's the that's the yeah. The question, question. Yeah, that is correct. And then she used okay. the example of about being sneaky and about yeah, the disconnect as examples. Yeah. So the disconnect between our two generations and why they feel they need to be sneaky around okay. us. And then the tattoo is an example of the disconnect. Right. Right. Correct. Right. Right. Well, the, the, the sneakiness, right. the the doing, and then asking for forgiveness. Okay. So did you want to take the question? Or am I still taking the question? Oh, you no, you're still taking take the it. question. I just want to make oh, sure we're talking okay. about the same thing. I always, I always I like to make sure we're talking about the same thing. OK, <laughs> all right. So we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, my, so you want to know why there's a disconnect between our generation? And also, why do you feel you have to be sneaky? Yes, ma'am. So from my perspective, I feel like the disconnect sometimes come about, comes about really plainly due to simply disconnect lack of information, lack of understanding, lack of awareness. It's not so much as a disconnect because we were kids before, right? We all had the same issues when we were your age with our parents. And so I feel like sometimes it's just a lack of information, lack of disconnection. I also want to, I do want to go back to the tattoo though, because I think that's a really good example of sneakiness, of disconnect. Because when you say to us, for instance, the tattoo, I immediately see, I, I sometimes, I'll see like a sleeve. I now know what a sleeve means. I'm cool like that. I immediately <laughs> see a sleeve when you see a tattoo or I see a whole body painting. And so I remember my daughter came to me and my children know I have two kids, one's 28 and one's 26. They know they, don't, they never have to sneak. There's never been sneakiness around in our house. You come to me, you tell me. I might not agree. And I'll tell you why I don't agree. That doesn't mean you get to do it, but we'll talk about it. So the tattoo issue, we had the discussion. My daughter wanted a tattoo. I told her when you're 18, you'll, have, you'll get a tattoo. I've never really had a problem with tattoos. The only problem I had, and I didn't clarify, so talking about information, I said, what kind of tattoo will you be getting? She, being a teenager, said, oh, I'm gonna get a Bible verse. I said, oh, okay, that's good. What Bible verse will you be getting? Oh, it's gonna be your favorite Bible verse. Philippians 4.13, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I said, oh, that's nice. It's a Bible verse. It's my favorite Bible verse. I failed to ask her, how exactly will this Bible verse look? Philippians 4.13, spelled out <laughs> all down her arm. So she comes home and it was like, well, you said I could get a Bible verse. Well, here is the whole Bible verse down my arm. And so I feel that, so I'm using that as an example, number one, as a disconnection between us, lost in translation, right? But I also feel like sometimes 
as children, as you guys, because you'll always be our children no matter how old you are. As children, I think the misunderstanding comes in when you don't lay all your cards on the table. Just lay them on the table. Lay all the cards on the table regardless. And that's what I tell my children. Tell me everything regardless of how bad it is. I need to know today every single thing. And then we'll talk about it. You could be in trouble. You could be grounded. You might not even be in trouble, but let's talk about it. So there's no need to sneak. There's no need to sneak. There's no need to snuff around. There's no need to, you know, tell me today. And so I, th I hope that answered the question. I hope that, you know, gives you some sort of insight. But I feel like the bottom line is the sneakiness, so to speak, comes about when you don't lay all your cards on the table regardless of what it is. Just come out plain and simple. Tell me what it is. Tell me the whole thing. So my daughter didn't tell me the whole thing, right? She didn't say she's going to spell out the whole entire Bible first. She made it seem to me it's going to be like one, three words and one letter, you know? So that's sneakiness. And at the end of the day, she didn't get in trouble because I told her she could get it. So I hope that answered the question to some degree, to some level, but- yes. And I'm going to um, come back to you because you mentioned about how we don't lay all our cards on the table. And I feel like that's from because we know what you're about to say already. And mm -hmm. we know that, OK, let's not give her all the full information. Let's just give her half of it. And we may be able to get through, get past it, get be able to get away with the whole thing. As I said before, better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel like where? What's the mistake there? What's the problem there? Why is it that we feel like, okay, we'll just give her half the information just so that we be able to get away with it because we know she's not going, going to agree in the first, um, if she knows the full thing. So Tommy, let me just come in here and ask you a question. Um, and I know these questions do not necessarily, um, are not necessarily your personal questions. Um, the sneakiness, do you think, um, if we had better communication and less disconnect, do you feel that um, it would be easier for us to be able to have these conversations and so that we're laying our cards on the table and being honest one with another, whether we seek approval or not? <laughs> Someone from the chat said yes. Um, okay. <laughs> I feel like okay. if we know you, you're not gonna shut us down. Because if I already know, my parents are still going to say no on the tattoo. No matter how I spin it all around, it's still gonna come out no, because I know that's how they feel about the whole thing. But if I feel like there's room to work with, if I feel like I can't be able to convince them it's not a total shutdown, then maybe we'll be more willing to give, give you the full information, give you all the cards, if that makes sense. Honest, so, oh, um, I'm sorry, Tommy. Honestly, from a from a youth perspective, Elder I feel Richardson. like. Sorry, um, let me just ask Elder Elder Richardson. Are you able to just throw some light here? Because what I'm hearing is more of um, a, a breakdown in communication um, that's leading to this sneakiness rather than or a, a presumption that we're going to say no um, before we even have the conversation. So Elder Richardson, if you're if you're able to kind of help us here, do you want to jump in? I'll be glad to jump in. Would I help? I don't know. But here's my thoughts. Is sneakiness avoidable? No, I just think that's natural in teenagers and in the parent-child relationship. Just whether you're the most open parent, whether you're the coolest parent, I just think every child will say, okay, let me do it or let me do it and see if I can just sneak it on them. So. Um, anybody's welcome to jump in there, but I really think that's unavoidable. The other challenge is this. What is the nature of your parents' parenting skill? Are they parent, parenting as a parent that just simply says this, you know, I'm the parent, you're the child? Or are they parenting as um, we're buddies or you, you, you're, you're equal to me? And as a result, then the nature of the relationship is very different. So it varies but I think sneakiness is totally unavoidable. I am open to hear our two young experts to agree or disagree or anybody in the chat, but sneakiness, I think it's unavoidable. Um, All right, I definitely um, Josh, think... you were about to say something. So Josh, 
I, I definitely think to, I, to, to an extent. You were going to say something before Elder Richardson spoke with us. So do you want to go ahead and say what you wanted to say? Um, yes. So from my perspective, I think like um, Dr. Richardson said, I feel like to an, extent, to an extent, there is always going to be some level of, of sneakiness from our generation naturally. But also when it comes to the question of why there's a disconnect, I honestly think it just boils down to upbringing. I feel like mm. both generations were raised in two different environments, two different societies. How we view things and how we see things on topics like tattoos and, and dating and relationships all differ based off like upbringing. So I, I, to, if I was asked that question of why there's a disconnect, I think that would be my answer. Uh, Attorney Lewis, solutions to this disconnect. Um, I, I think I, I, I think as a speaking to the young people, um, when when did when did your parents or your parents' friends have children for the first time? 25, 28, 30. So when you say I have a 15 year old and the parent is 45, the parent has the benefit of remembering they your 45 year old parent remembers what it's like to be 15 and they mm -hmm. and they have the part of the disconnect is experience they have the insight and the hindsight to understand that what you consider important right now at 15 is irrelevant i understand mm -hmm. you think it's super important but your parents mm -hmm. have the hindsight at 45 because they thought some of the same things were important at 15 to realize that's just not important. That's not important. And so your parents want you to focus on what's important while you may want to focus on what's popular, what's hot, what interests you. And that's some of the disconnect, just the, just the experience between being conscious for 10 years between five and 15 and being conscious for 40 years between, between five and, 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 and 45. Now, young people will always young people always think they're hip they always you know and the technology is only what i would say turbocharged to disconnect oh you guys didn't have snapchat when you were young you guys didn't have instagram when you were young that doesn't matter human beings haven't changed that much in the last 150 years the technology changes but human beings haven't changed Young people are still looking to be accepted. Young people are still looking to pull away a little bit from their parents. They're trying to figure out what their value systems are. And there are a number of young people that don't necessarily want to adopt their parents' values. If my, and I have two children. I mean, the people that have four or five children, my hats are off to them. I only have two boys. And if they come home and start talking about tattoos, the first thing I'm gonna do is say, bring me your report card. Because you don't need to worry about any tattoo if you're getting a C in history. You're worrying about the wrong things. And, and, that, and, that's, and that for me is what the issue is. It's not a question of not listening to them. I, it's not really a question of them putting all the cards on the table. I, the, 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 the panelist that said her daughter wanted a Bible verse, well, it may have been small. And then when she said it was okay, then it became real large. And so when she says somebody's not putting all the cards on the table, we get the tattoo approval first, and then we'll tell you it's a whole sleeve. You see, but but it doesn't matter if you put all the cards on the table or not with me, because I need to know what your grades are. I, I need to know where you are with your with your body image. I need to understand what you know about your health. All the rest of it is distraction to me. So I have to sort of, and I'm assuming other parents also have to tolerate these things that young people consider important that really on hindsight, when the young people are 30, 35, 40, 45, they look back, they realize, that really was nothing. That really was just, you know, that, that just wasn't anything that, you know, that I should have been interested in. But you're young. And so, you know, you, you do what young people do. That's what I think part of the disconnect is experience, technology. Um, and then some parents just don't, some parents don't just go, they're less tolerant of foolishness. All right. So I think what we're saying is there will be some level of sneakiness just because we're generations apart. We're also saying that parents have been where you are as teenagers and kind of have, uh, are now um, um, better in a better position to be able to advise. And we're also saying that if we're able to communicate better based on parenting styles and values in the home, maybe, just maybe we can avoid or deal with some of these things in a better way. But can I All say right? I think that's our, our conclusion right now. 
Go ahead, um, Mrs. Aramu. I would like to chime in one, just really quickly on that point. Okay. We can beat the horse a little bit more. I do think we're missing the point here. I think that it's very important why we have these kind of events and we're doing these kind of discussions. I feel we're missing a very fundamental point. And I think the fundamental point that we're missing is we cannot dismiss the fact that what is important to these teenagers or these young kids doesn't seem important to us now. Yeah, yeah. What is important to them, um, um, them as they go along in life? And these things to a 12 year old, to a five, to a seven, to a 10 year old, getting, going out to watch a movie or whatever, staying past a certain time is very high on their priority list. They don't particularly care about their grades. We have to make them realize that. It's not that the grades are not important, but I feel like as parents, as adults, if we shut those things down and then tell them, you have to, I don't care about what you think right now about certain things in your life. When my children were younger, their grades, of course, high priority, going to, you know, you have going to high priority, but, what I said earlier on, and I want to reiterate what I meant, what I meant is that you have to be able, they have to know that certain things, even though I, they're not important to me, it's incomprehensible to me that you would even care about certain things. But I look at you in your face and I say to you, I understand how this, I, un, I hear you, even though I don't really care about what you're thinking about, but you have to make them know it's important. I feel as adults, we get into that place with our children, with, our, with the yeah. young ones, where we say to them, just deal with your grades for right now. Just focus on your education and all these things. And then later on, after you've gotten all these things in place, we can talk about those other things. And at that point, they're sh shut down. They're in a point now where they don't even know how to communicate with us anymore because they've never been able to. They've never known how to come to us to tell us that the boy in school said something mean to them on the school bus. Because all I care about is that did you get home on school on time and you just get on with your homework. And so now that they're older and they're off to college, they don't have that way to talk to me anymore because I never really developed that with them. So I think we need to be very, very careful. And I just feel like I, sh I feel I just feel I should say that we should talk about things like that. We need to be able to balance these things with these kids and make them understand that even if we don't think these things are important to us. If they say it's important to them, then we need to listen to it. And then we balance these things out. Great okay. education I, is all important, but we I, have to balance. I, 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 I think, think, I think, I think no, okay, just so we don't, so we can move on to the next question. I think what we're all saying is that um, there has to be some level of priority as to what's important and that we have to leave the lines of communication open um, without necessarily shutting them down, but also making them understand that, um, Certain things um, are important, but certain things are priority. I think that's what we're all saying right now. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get Josh to give us the second question. Okay, so- um, Josh, is it your is, turn yet? It is. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the second, question, the second question is, in this age that we live in, I feel like an important topic for our generation is mental health. Um, in schools, we highlight mental health and like have mental health weeks that bring awareness to it. So to our panelists, we have a question of how aware are you of the importance of mental health in our generation? All right, I'm gonna just make sure I understand your question. Your question is the importance of mental health to mm -hmm. this generation and how we view mm -hmm. that and how important it is to us as much as it is to you. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm OK, excellent. All right, I'm going to let you start, Elder Richardson, with this one. And we're talking about um, the importance of mental health in terms of this generation and our views in terms of um, what kind of weights we should be placing on it. Excellent. I am not wearing my shirt today. But if I was wearing my shirt, it simply says Jesus and therapy. Those are the two that keep me going. Unfortunately, I did not grow up in a generation that said uh, mental health was a priority. So Josh, for you to be able to say that and emphasize that now, it is so important. Um, the father of two teenagers, a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old, 
Um, I look at them and I weep inside and I privately cry because I can't imagine what it's like for my 17 year old to be a senior and this is her senior year. Her prom dress from last year is still hanging in the closet where she wasn't able to attend the prom. And it's one of those things where, you know, I extended opportunity for her to talk to me. Um, but the proudest moment came when she simply went to my wife and said, I need help. I'm in a place where I'm not feeling well. I'm not in a, not physically feeling well, but emotionally not well. And that was the proudest moment. And I was open with my children when it came to the point that I was not coping well. The preacher needed therapy, thus my t-shirt, Jesus and therapy. So needed, I talk about it, I preach about it, I share it with others because the more we talk about it and the more we put it on the table, I'm not healthy, the better we help each other. I hope that answered the question. Attorney Lewis, do you wanna chime in here, please? Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to share with you um, a little bit, I guess, about my history and a little bit about sort of how I've seen things changed. Um, I remember the '70s, and as as I think it's the young man's name is Josh, as he says, I feel that just wasn't really in in. <laughs> with my family, with my uncles specifically, with my dad, with my uncles, that really wasn't a phrase that came out of my mouth much. I feel. It was, it was I think, I know, uh, I thought, but not too much I, I feel. Um, as, a, as a black man being raised by other black men in a, in a predominantly black environment, nobody really dealt with their feelings a lot. And so I've had to sort of get used to that um, in my law practice. When in 2000, uh, people still talked about I think, and now in 2020, people don't talk about I think. Everybody talks about their feelings. And, and one of the things that I'm sort of uncomfortable with, I understand the value of mental health, one of the things that I'm uncomfortable with is, is the fact that if you say I feel like one plus one plus one is eight, that's right. If you say, I think one plus one plus one equals eight, that's wrong, because it's three. But if you feel like it might be eight, people have to actually listen to that without telling you that you're wrong. And so I really don't have a, a good handle on, on I, I want to call it firmness. I want to call it push through. I want to call it double down. What happens when you go to university and you get an 82 on the first exam and you say, listen, I wanna share with my feelings with you. Um, about what? I got an 82 on the exam. Okay, what did you want? I wanted a 92. Okay, you gotta double down. You don't really need to share your feelings about that. You just have to study more. Now, if you study more the second time, study more the third time, and you feel yourself going to a place where you find it hard to study because of your mental health, then we have to talk. But, 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 the, but the talking about your, how you feel about that grade early on before you start talking about what you're going to do to double down, that, that's, I, I have yet to form that a comfortable paradigm, even in my own life, about that. You understand? So I just sort of take a step back with my children. I, I look at them. I ask them some questions uh, in, terms of, in terms of academics. I ask them some things about things that they value and what they're willing to work at. And then I just sort of take a step back and I let them talk to me about what it is, you know, that, that they might be going through. I think I'm in touch with my feelings. I just don't really talk about them that much. I don't, I don't do backstrokes in my feelings. I understand when I'm sad, when I'm sad, I cry. When I'm sad, I'm sad. Um, but, but I don't talk about my feelings probably as much as the new generation likes talking about their feelings. And in my, in my work, um, everybody wants to avoid accountability by saying it's a mental health problem. Somebody's dead, somebody's, somebody's molested, somebody, let me talk to you about my mental health. We can talk about your mental health, but the, the judge is going to give you a consequence. And so when, in my experience, professionally, a lot of the talk about mental health is used to avoid accountability. And, and legally, there's very little 
area for avoiding accountability by talking about mental health. There is some, I mean, obviously we know what insanity is, but the bipolar, I have HD, I have ADHD, I can't go to prison. None of that's going to work. And I sort of, it, the law is really comfortable for me because that's the sort of mindset I'm in. I'm accountable for my actions. If I have a mental health problem, I have to deal with that. Um, but but a lot of the mental health that that I hear people talking about, like I'm sad. Okay, you're going to be sad sometimes. Sometimes it's going to be sadness. Sometimes it's going to be happiness. And the fact that you're sad is not a mental health problem. You're just sad. It's okay to be sad. No. So I um I I think I want to clarify some of the things. I think what um if I if I'm wrong, correct me, Josh. What he's what he's jumping into is that. Life is real and not all of us have the same constitution to be able to deal with um, the things that happen in our life like you would. You may have a stronger constitution. So if a child sees parents going through divorce and is beginning to be affected by that, that child should, should have the resources available to them to be able to get Absolutely. help. Absolutely. So not necessarily they're going to start on some psychiatric medications. Yeah, so I think that's where he's coming from, where he's not labeled or the child is not labeled because they want some therapy to talk through the issues and get some sort of direction. Um, and I think as parents, we need to be able to support our children to be able to get to a point where they say, I need help. So let's get some help without discounting it and thinking that no, um, you're sad, you're sad, get over it and move on. I think that's where Josh is coming from. So I'm gonna let Mr. Zara move just hear your let, perspective in all of this. Let me say, let me just say one thing. Josh, everything everybody's going through something. You have I, I am of course. Uh, uh, oh yeah. sorry. But yeah, but not everybody has the same ability in terms of being able to overcome what they're going through. And sometimes that's, that's you do need that, a helping that, hand. Yeah, that, and so I, I want them to know that if they ever feel that they need a helping hand, they shouldn't feel that they're stigmatized and not able to go to a parent or a loved one and say, hey, I need help. So let me get some help. All right, so let me get um, Dr. Uh, Mrs. Aremu, please, if you can um, chime in here. Okay, excuse me, please. Um, I'm using my privilege right here. I know it's an important topic and we're having a good conversation about it, but we're like um, 45 minutes in and we're still about on number three out of about 15 questions. And I know the youths really want to get through all their questions. So if we can, you know, speed it up a little bit. Thank you. And okay. Dr. Kizik, please check your, your phone and your chat. Absolutely, I'll do that. Go ahead, Mrs. Aramu, and then... Um... No, we can I can we can skip to the next one because I'm I'm I am very um I'm on the totally opposite spectrum from um the gentleman that just spoke earlier on. I am all for the um the feelings and the um you know I feel like it's a very needed thing. I feel like mental health uh, doesn't get as much I feel like it's shut down a lot, especially in the youth. I feel like it brings up a whole different spectrum of all kinds of things. It leads to children feel like they don't get hurt and it develops, it snowballs into a whole lot of other things. Then you get the drug abuse, the substance abuse. I don't think it's heard well enough. And I think, um, like the Dr. Ngozi said, when the children feel like they're not being heard, it snowballs very quickly into a lot of things. And I've known a lot of children who've gone downhill. So I feel like children should know to ask for help, to understand that it's okay to not to feel sad, even if everybody else is happy and to understand that there's no stigma around if you need medication, if you need to see somebody, speak up, get the help, and, and, and keep it going. Can, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, when they, say when they say stigma, when your child comes to you, there won't be any stigma. But if your child is big on social media and they let other people know, there may be stigma. And there's no way the parent can stop that stigma. And so, okay. so when you so, say stigma, um, um, sorry, just like um, um, Mr. Ojetokun said, I think we'll probably have to move on. 
And oh, I think okay. we're going to need more than one session because I don't think we'll get through 15 questions. And it's good for the children to hear us dialogue because we're all parents. And so it's nice for them to see everyone parents a little differently. So yes, I think it would be absolutely. nice for them to see us very do this. Yeah. yeah, do this so they can understand. Maybe find their parents in the midst of all the four of us somehow identify <laughs> yeah. their, their mothers a little bit of Iremu with a little bit of Richardson with a little bit of Lewis. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> if, I, if I help them understand us a little better too. Uh -huh. All right, let's take the third question. And I am going to ask uh, Mrs. Odeto Kun to please arrange another session because I don't think we're going to get through all of this. And I think it would be nice for the kids to be able to 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 have this um, another this session. Is to be able an to hour, right? Is it an hour? Other yeah, exactly. So I don't see us getting through all of these questions. But let's take the third question. I will yeah. say we so about to answer to your hour. question, Josh. Yes, it is okay to get help. <laughs> Um, is, is Josh, did you hear me? Mm -hmm. And all the team, it is okay to get help if you think you need help. All right? Okay. Go ahead. Um, I mean, go ahead. Um, so actually, Josh has more mental health questions coming up. I am going to finish up what we started earlier for my first question, because the le next question kind of goes back to that. And so we can finish okay. up with the whole disconnection disconnecting thing. So my next question is, what can um, what can our parents do to help the children understand why parents make that the decisions that they do? Now I'm tied back to what Dr. Uh, I said doctor, what Mr. Lewis or Lewis was saying about the whole, you have experience. And so you feel like some things we say is not as important as what we may believe. But you see, the thing is that as that happens, it, there's gonna be a, as we said, a disconnect and we'll stop, I'll stop asking you questions. Like if you're my dad, I'll stop act, telling you about stuff because you're gonna feel like, oh, it's not so important. And there's no point in telling him about all this. And maybe in the future, I may understand why you said what you said, but the damage is already kind of done. Well, well, I still. Let, 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 me, let me say this. The first question you ask is why is there a disconnect? Yes, sir. And my answer was my answer was an answer to that question. When 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 you at, when you go to the next part, the next question is how can we help to resolve the disconnect? See, I only answer the question the judge asks me. I don't volunteer other answers. I just answer the questions that I'm asked. Why is there a disconnect? That's why I think there's a disconnect. How we will resolve that disconnect? How I resolve that disconnect? I pretend like I'm interested. That's easy <laughs> enough. But, I, but, but am I really interested? It's hard for me to really be interested. You're 14 years old. Uh, somebody says something mean to you at school. I'm going to pretend to be super interested. I'm going to pretend because I can't really get into that because it's not really important. But I'm going to pretend you will believe that I'm interested. But that there will always be the disconnect because I can't emotionally tie. Do you remember when you were embarrassed when like when you were 12 or 13 or 14? I'm sure I did. Was it super important then? I, I don't remember if it was super important. I assume for a moment it was super important. But when I went home, the only thing that my parents cared about were my grades. And so, you know, sometimes you sometimes it's difficult for you to parent beyond how you were parented. Okay, so um, Tommy, we're going to get another perspective, and I'm going to get uh, Mrs. Aremu. And the question is, how do we deal with this disconnect, and how do we get parents and children to better understand each other and have a relationship that allows for connectivity? I think that's basically what we're talking about. So, Mrs. Aremu, how did you do it? How did you connect mm. with your I children? Think how did you me, I think I'm coming in once again from a different angle. When I was growing up, I, I was born in England and my parents worked like multiple jobs and my mom was in school. So I lived with a nanny. I lived with a, a, a white nanny in a, in a white family for about the first six years of my life. And so I had a different upbringing. And so when I was seven, I was taken to Nigeria suddenly. And so it's totally different when I got to Nigeria. So everything was completely different and it was a shock to me. And it shaped the way I went through my elementary school because all of a sudden 
the way the way I was the way I was in when I was in Gillingham Kent was different. Every time we sit around, they would talk. We would they would my my nanny would listen. She would do my hair. She paid attention. I'm not saying it's the right way for parenting. I'm not saying it's the wrong way. It was just different. When I went back to Nigeria, it's a bigger family. You know, you're in a bigger family. It's a bigger community. Things are different. I immediately felt like I was of a bigger community, and nobody really paid that much attention to me. I'm not knowing, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It was just different. What that did to me as a little girl then was it made me become really quiet. People who know me now, I've written three books. You'll read, you can read about it. People who know me now, when they read about how I was raised, they're like, oh, wow, I became very quiet. I became like I had to be out of the way because I didn't want to bother anybody. I felt like I was a bother. And when, when I got older now, a little bit older, I determined to my children, I never want you to feel like you're a bother. I'm not your friend, I'm your mother, but I don't want you to feel like a bother. So you're important. So whatever happens to you, no matter how small it is, is important to me. So I don't care if the child on the bus, my daughter tells the school, my daughter's 27. She still, she still tells the story today like it happened yesterday. A boy made fun of her on the school bus. I waited for the bus. You're not allowed to get on the school bus. I got on the bus. I said, is your name Lonnie? If you <laughs> ever talk to my daughter again, you will be sorry. It never happened again. Things like that were important to her. Did it matter to her grades? Of course not. But Lonnie is not going to make fun of my child in school. So I'm telling you those because I feel like those kind of connections to me, I think are important. I'm not saying if it's, I don't know if it's right or wrong. That's just the way I parent my children. Now they're older, they both live in New York City. They don't live at home, they both live in New York City. But I feel like it makes a difference. So they can come to you and I promise you, my daughter especially has come to me with stories that I'm, if I tell you the things I've done with my daughter, you'll be shaken to the T. And are they successful? Of course they are. My daughter designed for the Black Panther movie. My son works for The View, but they come to me with stories that things that they've done, like, I'm, but I try to keep a straight face because I feel like we have that connection. So you have to, I feel this is just what happens, what works for Nikkei. I don't know if it works for anybody else. I feel like that bridge has to be built very, very young. And the only way it could be built is things that matter to you matter to me, plain and simple. That's just- Okay, so Mr. I'm hearing you say, develop a relationship that's intimate with your children and what matters to them matters to you. And Attorney Lewis, I'm saying, I'm hearing you say, I will listen to you. And even though you think I'm really listening, I'm pretend listening if that makes you better. But at the end of the day, um, those things may not necessarily be important. Well, because that's the um, case. Just, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, they on, will Attorney make Lewis. mistakes. One more, no, one more. I want to get Elder Richardson's perspective. And so we have all three of you before we kind of wrap up and see what the kids think. Elder Richardson, what is your take on this? So I'm going to come from two places. First place is I'm intrigued by the background of both of the other parents on the panel because that is our marinade. That is our makeup. That who, that's part of who we become. Um, I have friends that are on here and I'm a mother with her daughter and we're chatting privately, thank the Lord. <laughs> But one of the comments <laughs> helped me remember, I was not raised with my father. I am the product of two um, young people at 19 who had a child out of wedlock in the late 60s. Back then it was taboo. And so I did not meet my father. I did not have a relationship with my father until I was in high school when I met him. When I met him in high school, he had a drug problem that was hid for me for three years. And so by the time we had relationship, I had already served in the military, gotten out of the military. He and my, parent, my mother married later, unmarried after that point. And my marinade is very, very different. I was raised by a single mother in Miami, Florida. So she raised me with what we technically would call a heavy hand child abuse today. Back then it was necessary. Back then it was, you know, what she had to do to save me off the streets. Her quote, I'm beating you now so that no one in the street would have to beat you. Extreme, but it was what was necessary for them. And then I lived a life of watching them married for 30 years. 
All of us are made up from different marinades and it, it affects our parenting skills. Here is what that marinade for me did. I do not administer corporal punishment to my daughters because I walked away with the philosophy, those who were abused have the tendency to abuse. Now, do I make sure that those two young ladies fear me? They fear God and then they fear me next. So they've never had corporal <laughs> punishment from me, but they understand their father is not wrapped tight. He is not mentally sane. He's from Miami, Florida, that says enough. You with me? The other part of it is, I think there's a balance in it. I don't know, um, I've met you um, years ago, Attorney Lewis, when we did something like this in person. And I would be challenged to say, is your wife the balance for you and, and for your children? Because I think sometimes we married the opposite. And I'm just putting it out there, putting it I out say, there. I would say, I would say, I would say absolutely yes, because early on in the relationship, she said, listen, she didn't want, she didn't want it. She, she had seen some things in her own family with corporal punishment and said they shouldn't be in the corporal punishment. And since I, I and since I'm a chronic, this phone keeps ringing off the hook because of politics. Hold on. <laughs> and you're going to answer it for real? No, no, no. I'm just, no, I just got to shut it off. Um, <laughs> um, um, so, so yes. So, so she, so she had a little bit different experience in terms of corporal punishment, and and so I understood, I understood that that corporal punishment is is how would I say it? It's a, it's I would say it's cheap and dirty, and so if you're an educated person, you can you can use something else. If you have some resources, you can use something else. But corporal punishment works, and and it's cheap and dirty. So when she said she didn't want to do it, I was like, I understand that. I understand that, and I really didn't have any issue with that. Um, and, and I think you're right. I think we ultimately come from a place. I mean, I've done a lot of reading and I'm trying to improve myself ultimately as a parent. Um, but, but I think as a parent where I start, and I have two boys, I don't have any girls. And I think, I think that also may change some things. As a, as, a, as a parent of boys, I start with this point. Tell me what you wanna do. Don't tell me what your friends want you to do. Tell me what you wanna do. And if you tell me you want to play baseball, we're going to go full force on that. If you tell me you want, now, when you tell me you want to play baseball and then you come back a month later and tell me you want a tattoo, you got to make that tattoo fit in with the baseball. Whatever you tell me you're about, chess, uh, robotics, whatever you say you're about, I'm all the way in. Now, most children, we're putting all our cards on the table, are mm -hmm. not going to say, I just really want to be popular. I'm not really about nothing. I just want to be popular and get the most likes on Snapchat. Because if that's what you told me you were about, then we would do that. But most children don't want to say that because it seems shallow. So mm -hmm. they make big grand gestures because they want big grand statements. I love big grand statements and I know the work involved and I want to chase it with you. But then you got to make all these other little side distraction things make sense in terms of us chasing the big goals, college, uh, 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 ice skating, whatever it may be. Tell me what you want, I'm all in. Time, money, effort, I'm all in. Don't just, the little boy says something mean to me on the bus. When you're ice skating, somebody's gonna say something mean to you from the ice, get over it, get over it. Tell me what you want, let's go get that. And if you don't know what you want, that's fine. I'll, I'll wait over there. And when you figure out what you want, I'll, I'll give you some options and you want my attention, then I'll come on over and talk to you. But most people want something or say they want something. When you actually start working on it, you find that eh, they don't really want that. Tell me what you want, because what you want should direct your values, your perception, your time, your energy. That's what I'm about. Don't distract me. If the tattoo, oh. if, if you want to be an actor and the tattoo helps you, let's go get the tattoo. All right. So what we're saying, I think, Toby, basically, and on behalf of all the other um, teenagers and kids out there, what we're saying is that um, with this issue of conflict, with the issue of connectivity, where your parents come from in terms of how they were parented influences some of that. And so um, I guess it's gonna be a discussion for another day. Some of the things we've done is when you sit at a dinner table together, it um, somehow forces and engenders conversation. And in the process of doing those things, you will get to understand your parents a little better and where they're coming from. And that might help you understand why they do the things they do 
and everyone parents a little differently. So that I don't think it's a question of it being right or wrong. It is different. And you have to understand where they're coming from to be able to understand why they do some of the things that they do. And I hope that kind of helps with that question. Josh, I think it's your turn now. Um, okay, um, so Okay, can I ask a question? Yes. Are you ready, Josh? Go ahead with your question. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of questions because I think this is a very important question. So should I communicate with my parents the issues that I have with the way they raised me or like the way they are raising me currently? Or if you're like, you're an older child and like as uh, Mrs. Aramu, you have older children, for example, if your kids come to you and say, oh, I had a problem with my upbringing and the way you raised me, or as a child, or like as you are, you supposed to just let it go and see as water under the bridge. What is your opinion? All right, um, Mrs. Aramusinsi directed it to you. The question is, if as a child you have a problem, um, I don't know that problem is the right word to use, but if you, if you have questions about the way your parents um, raised you, um, is it okay to come to them and have the discussion as to some of the things you think were right or wrong? Is that correct, Josh? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mrs. Iremu, would you have a problem with your children coming to you and saying to you, I don't like the way you raised me? All these feely, touchy things, I don't like it. You should have been firm. You should have been like um, Attorney Lewis. What do you want and where are we going? <laughs> so how would you feel about that? <laughs> no, wow. I think um, as much as um, that's one, that's somewhere we're going to draw the line. I, I think that some things I feel, I think earlier on we had said, some things are like non negotiable. I'm the parent. So I, as the parent, there are certain things that I, I, know, I know better. And so I'll raise you as a parent. If you, if there, but then there's some things that you can come to me about. Heaven forbid, if my child comes to me and says, when you sent me to spend the summer with my uncle, he abused me, he molested me. Right. Then you come to me, we'd have a discussion. Or when you sent me to the babysitter, she physically abused me. Um, but if, if you're sending me, like if you come to, if my, my children cannot tell me how you were raised, then you're questioning my parenting skill. That's a problem. And that's okay. not up for discussion. So if you're questioning my parenting skills as a parent, that's not up for discussion. She, she, no. It's almost like uh, you just uh, turned uh, into a Mr. Lewis. Yes, you just turned into, you just turned into, into a Mr. Lewis. He just turned into a Mr. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> so you see what I'm saying, though? There's certain things that I think are non-negotiable. I'm a parent, so I know how to raise you. I'm your mother. So if you come to me and say, well, the way you raised me was not right. I think you were this, you were that. That's, that's offensive, I feel, to me. But if you said, if it's things that affected you physically, emotionally, you know, I was abused, I was, um, you know, I was physically abused, I was emotionally abused, then we talk about that. Is that what you're, is that the question? Did I get the question correct? No? Yeah, I, I think you did. Yeah, I think you got it right. Uh, but let, let, me, let me give an example. Like um, Elder Richardson said that corporal punishment you know, if I don't do the beating here at home, the streets eat you kind of thing. Um, and we're in a modern day and age where um, physical discipline is frowned upon. So if a child were to come to you and say, you know, like the judge said, the, there was a better way of disciplining me than using corporal punishment, would that be offensive to you as well? So now we didn't do physical punishment. So no, no, we're just saying just let's we're just using that as that an would example. Be, if I, if you came to me, if I had physical punishment. Well, God, I didn't though. But if somebody that's still questioning your your parenting skills, I think we have parenting to draw the skills, line somewhere. Okay. I think okay. as children, we also have to respect our parenting skills. People, I right. I, I got beat when I was you know I we had the in fact not just the beat. My mother will say to me, "Sometime tomorrow you'll get a whooping. Sometime tomorrow, let's do it now." <laughs> then you have to wait all day till tomorrow. <laughs> so there's emotional abuse that you're waiting for. Let's do it now. 
That's good <laughs> stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah. That's good well, stuff. Sometime tomorrow, you I'll deal with you sometime tomorrow. <laughs> I never had a problem with that. So I think I think at some point we draw the line somewhere though. I feel like the parenting skills, you know, we 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 raise our children the way we know how to. And I think as children, we, we have to respect that. Not everything yeah. my mother did, did I, do I agree with. But some so, things crossed the line, abuse, physical or sexual abuse, and we have a course. problem. Mm -hmm. But if I just so, say, well, the way you spoke to when I was growing up, I didn't like it. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I okay, just... I think um, from, from what I'm hearing in the background from Elder Richardson and Tony Lewis, I think what you are saying is um, agreeable across board that there has to be some degree of honor and respect for your parents yeah that even you don't you don't go around looking for criticisms as to how they raised you um but th there can be room for discussion i think that's what i'm hearing and there attorney is lewis and Absolutely. elder richardson is that l what, what listen I'm listen hearing? Go ahead. Let's, listen as, as a parent you're not going to help me parent you that's not going to happen. Yeah. And, okay. and as a, and as a, pa as a, gr as a grown I'm person. I'm not on Tony Lewis's team yet. I'm still not. Yeah, 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 you're, yeah, on yeah you're on my team. You're on my team. You're on my team. Because you said, you said the same thing I would say. Don't beat me sometime tomorrow. Let me get my whooping now. Let's Give me now. mine now. I don't want to wait. And, and, and if they're grown, if they're 24, 25, 26, and they disagree with something that I did, you know what I tell them? It's real simple. Show me better when you're a parent. Don't worry about criticizing what I did 10 years ago. Show me better when you're a parent. Find a wife, <laughs> hold a job, and then when you're tired after a 12 hour day, and your children are coming to you, show me better. Show me how I should have done it. Don't mm. tell me I did it wrong, show me. If All I right, can so Josh, jump in, I think- If I can jump in, there was a yeah, great ahead. comment that was in the chat. If you can go back and read that, I think it was from Tola, T-O-L-A, I love the way she put, that person put it, that they were saying it's about the approach and the motive behind the approach. Um, there's a balance in it. I don't recommend it, but there's a balance in it. Um, um, on the, in, the um, in this Zoom is Lisa Thomas with her 17-year-old daughter, Morgan. And they were saying she's raised her children. Now she has a 21-year-old, and I don't remember the other ages of the others, but her daughter Morgan is one that she's raised that Morgan can come and share her opinion. Now I challenge you to say, does that mean Morgan can share her opinion of how you raised Morgan or just her opinion general? I think there is a, an internal tick in every parent. I don't care what your temperament is, but when that child comes and speak to you about the, ra the way they raise you, Jesus and law enforcement <laughs> about the only things that can save you from that. And <laughs> I, I, I just honestly believe that. Can I please say something really quickly? All right. Um, what I, let, let me just read this comment from um, Tola, just because um, Elder Richardson brought it up. So she says, or he says, I think it is the approach that matters. Um, um, as every child, this right, it's the approach that matters and the motive behind the question. The child has to be respectful, and we can look at it from a place of improvement for my grandchildren. So I think that's that's the answer to that question, um, Josh. Um, you don't go around criticizing or looking for fault, um, but at the same time, if you come with some respect and you want a discussion, um, with you know from a perspective of being better with the grandchildren, then then that, that is open for grabs. Okay, All right. So, so um, are we? Does, is is that a? Is, are you good with that? Kind of, honestly. I, I think. Let's talk, Josh. Let's talk. Tell us what you're feeling. Tell us yeah. what, 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 what is it yeah, that you got, what is the response? What is it that you didn't get a response to? Yeah, but so, yeah. So when I ask the question, I'm, I'm talking from a, a perspective of if you feel like a way you were raised has affected you negatively now. Okay. If you were raised in a way that like now you can't communicate to your your spouse because as how you grew up you felt like you cannot communicate to your parents and, mm. and that's transpired into your relationship with your significant other so if however you were raised has now negatively impacted you okay if you now decide to come back to like the source of the problem which was your parents okay is that are you wrong in doing that or no can you... i can i answer no, no, no. that so, can I yeah go okay go ahead i was just gonna so now that's a different go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
So then you've rephrased the question. That's a different thing. So remember mm -hmm. I had said, if there's things that have affected you negatively, mm -hmm. that's a different way. That's a different part to the question. So I talked, I spoke about the whole thing generally. Mm -hmm. And so if there's things that have affected you, affected the person negatively that has now carried into your adult life, then absolutely mm -hmm. you have the right to come back to the parent. I'm, I'm glad I had certain discussions with my mom before she passed away. And mm -hmm. I sat her down and I said, there's certain things that we did when we were growing up, I didn't really like. And she said, like what? And so I, you know, you know, and I said, you know, when we were growing up, we never really sat around and said sorry about certain mm -hmm. things. She said, like when? You know, and then we had those discussions because I felt like for me, I'm grown and married. I, I felt like I struggled with that. I really struggled saying sorry. I mean, I'll analyze and I'll logicalize and I'll say, but I won't really say those words. And so I feel like those kind of things, you absolutely have a way to respectfully bring them up. When I was talking generally, I'm talking when you come with the attack. I think it's the attack that makes us feel, make us feel like we failed woefully in life. But if you come with specific things, because we learn, nobody came with the Parenting 101 book, right? We learn as we go along. We're going to have Agreed. grandchildren, so Agreed. we can do, more, do better. So if it's specific, specific things that you've carried forward into your life, absolutely, you can come back and talk about it. That, that's not what I meant when I said there's no discussion. Specific things like that, for sure, you can talk about. And we remember things crystal clear. We can come back and have a discussion. So I hope that answers. Yeah. So I think it goes back with uh, what was placed in the chat, that if you come respectfully to have the discussion, you know, with the intent that they could do, we can do better with our grandchildren and it may help you in your oh, relationship. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Think that's, I think that's where the, um, it has to be a respectful discussion yeah. about what happened and not a criticism you shouldn't have done this you should have done that but look yeah. this is affecting me I don't I can't communicate like I should we can work through it together so I hope that brought some more clarity to your question Josh can, 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 can I ask okay. one question of Josh just one question yeah, yeah, yeah. Lewis. Jo one jo question jo okay here's a question jo Josh when, when you when you're 45 do you think you can go back and talk to your parents about the 10 years that they raised you between five and 15 and absolve yourself of the 30 years that you had to fix yourself? I, I feel like it honestly all depends on how you turned out. I feel like it, it all okay, depends be, on- be, oh, Let me just say, because with the parenting, that, that's not cement shoes. Mm -hmm. We, we, we just, you, you got to a certain point at 20, you know, you can assume responsibility for your own growth, your own, if you, if, if, if I've never found my voice, you got, you got, you got the, the next 70 years to find your voice. Now, if you're too scared to find your voice, I don't know that you can go back and tell your parents, I don't have my voice because you didn't give it to me when I was young and I'm Objection. too scared to go get it now. Objection, badgering the witness. Oh, sorry, sorry. Objection, <laughs> sorry. moderator, objection. <laughs> All right. uh, sorry. Yeah, attorney Lewis. No, you're, that's, you're, that's, um, okay, that's, so the next question. Yeah, so I think this, 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 we need to do this um, a little more often. Mm. Okay, next question, Tommy. I think you have the next question. I, I, uh, the way I'm looking at the time, that might be the last question. That's totally fine. Hopefully, yeah, so please go ahead, Tommy. I'm going to bring everything we've said to the conclusion and ask, how do you as parents, as individual parents, I'm going to ask the whole panel right now, how do you try and explain your decisions to your kids so that they'll understand why you're doing what you're doing and they just don't feel very attacked by it? By it? What? What, what's your own parenting style for that? So you're asking um, if, if our kids were to come to us, um, how do we have a conversation as to the reason behind what we do? No. Is that, is, did I understand the question right? Like if my dad tells me to do you're something. You're asking like, why do we do what we do? Uh -huh. Why do okay. you make the decisions that you make? So if my dad comes to me and tells me that, oh, you can only do something so, 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 and so, and so, how would you as a parent try to explain to them, this is why I've said so, this is why I do this, or do you not explain at all? And can you give us like examples of when you've had to explain to your child why you told them not to do what to, what 
they should do what they wanted to do. Okay, so Elder Richardson, I think everyone, again, we've talked about different parenting styles. So yeah. Elder Richardson, I'll let you go first. Then Attorney Lewis, you can go, Mrs. Aremu, and then I'll kind of tell you what I do. That's a challenging one, Tommy, I'm gonna say that. Um, now, I'm a different one. I can't say if I'm on team Auntie um, or <laughs> Attorney Lewis. I can't say because I am, I didn't mean to grow up and become the touch, well, I'm not the touchy-feely parent, but I am the vocal parent. Um, so raising two girls, I was the one that was the disciplinary because I was with them at home all the time. However, as the parent of teenagers, I am the one that want to talk it out. And everybody knows, agree with me, Tommy and Josh, every teenager is not willing to fill out, sit down and talk things out with their parents. Thus the sneaking, I digress. Um, <laughs> I do want, you know, it's just like, I, I want to know, I'm the parent to say, we're not doing this because such and such and such, such and such and such feedback, please. Crickets, crickets, crickets. And I'm like, okay. So I take your silence as consent and we're gonna move on because I gave you the opportunity. And every parent is not like that. And I just don't believe, I'm gonna be honest to y'all, Tommy and Josh, I don't think you want that. I think you ideally think that's good, but you don't want the parent that just gonna, cause I'm the one that sit down and do it. And just my girls are like, really dad? Oh my God, mm -hmm. this, now they don't verbally say this, but this is what their ver the body language says. Like, oh my God, is he really doing this? Is he really? Are we really having this moment? Why is it with dad? Dad is not the fun one, and I'm not. My wife is the fun one. My wife is, a, you know, the like their girlfriend because she's a female. I'm the only male in the house. But when I say something, I speak it, and then I give, like I'm doing with you guys, and I give time for feedback. I don't always get feedback. Now, I do have that one daughter, that one, and the parents on the panel can say and agree. You have one that's when they're born, you're like, oh, well, thank you, Jesus. So this is gonna be the one. I see that, all right, this is gonna be the one that's gonna challenge me, okay. And so that's the child that she does come every now and then and ask a question. She comes humbly, thank the Lord. And because she comes humbly, we can and we do have the discussion. Um, but the issue with it becomes this, it becomes a challenge when you're doing it for the wrong reason, or you're doing it to bring shade. Not that teenagers would ever bring shade, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I dropped the mic on that one. I'm finished. <laughs> All right, Attorney Lewis, you tell us. Um, let me say it like this. Um, I I've always been that person, and I like to believe I'm that person in the household. I just live my values. And, and what I do is I try to explain to my children why I do what I do. I can't, I, I, I don't ever really recall having a lot of rules. The, the, the youngest son went to bed on his own at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, so the bedtime rules, the TV rules. Um, they don't watch me watch a lot of TV. I mean, they watch TV. I, I kept TVs here that never really play video games. Um, you know, I fought the phone, phone, phone. They didn't get the phone till very later on in life. I didn't have a phone. You know, I, I had a pager still back in, I don't know, 2008, 2010. I mean, so, so I've just always lived my values and I've explained to my children why I live the values that I lived. And what I want them to do is I want them to look at me and decide I want his life or I don't want his life. And then we can talk about the life that you want because you may not want to be the person that's always dependable. You may want to be the fun guy. I, I can't be the fun guy. I got to be the person that's dependable because the fun guy doctor might show up for surgery. He might not show up. The fun guy lawyer might show up for your trial, might not show up. I, I just never been that guy. So I've never been the parent that put down a lot of rules. Here are all the rules and I got to explain the rules or why not the rules. Obviously, I want you to keep your room clean. Obviously, I want you to clean up after yourself in the bathroom. Obviously, uh, if you if you if you drink all the orange juice, don't leave an empty carton in the fridge. Like to me, those are common sense. If you open the door and and somebody's coming behind you, hold the door for them. So I've, I've taught them sort of social graces, how to say please and thank you. But there are not a lot of rules in the house. 
I expect you to 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 do what you think is best. And then if I have a, a strong disagreement with what you're doing, we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. But I really didn't start with a set of rules for my house. Mrs. Aremu. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, so I didn't start with a whole lot of rules in the house, other than other than look at me and and do what I do. Forget about what I say. Do what I do. That I guess that that would have been okay. the only rule I had. Mrs. Aram, would you want to go ahead and talk about your um, your view on this? So the when view tell... is how do we communicate uh, what we want them to do? Is that the, that's the question, right? Exactly. How do you get them to understand why? You want them to do certain things. I think for us, it's always been, we just sit, my, I just try to make it, and I'm the touchy-feely parent. We've already established that, right? <laughs> I just like to just explain in layman terms, you know, certain things. This would be, the, this is the right way. You know, it's just, just make it plain and simple. And it's always works. It's always, and there's just repercussion. There's always a repercussion if you don't do the right thing. So it's never been a long drawn out discussion. And it's always worked, um, you know, pretty well, more, all the time. Even, even little, even now with the COVID, it's not a long discussion. You can't. My son lives in New York. I just tell him, you know, you see what's going on, so you know you don't go out to bars. You don't do, and he just stays home. So it's really not, it's really not hard. I don't think it's ever been that difficult. No, it's not. For us. No. All right. For 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 me, it's a, a, a at this stage uh, where you are, Tommy and Josh, we have discussions. Um, before a certain age, I just said, I'm the parent, you're the child, this is what we're doing, and, you know, you know, suck it up, live with it. And then when you get to an age where you can reason, because I honestly don't expect you to do calculus if you haven't been taught two plus two is equal to four. So at certain ages, I don't expect you to make decisions that are right because you haven't been taught to make those decisions. You know, so I lay down the rule. But as my children get older, I just say to them, what are the pros and cons? Um, ultimate decision is yours. There are consequences to every decision. And if you're able to live with those consequences, go for it. And, and that's how we've kind of run our own home. And that's how I kind of parent it. So you've got four different views there, different ways of doing things. I don't know how your parents do it, but that's, that's kind of the four of us. We've given you our um, input. Um, from that standpoint. Um, Mrs. Odetokun, do we have time for one more question or do we just wrap up and kind of look for another opportunity? I think we can um, take to... two or three more. We can probably take this to, till 6 p.m. if people are still willing to wait. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I'm fine with that. I expect it to be four to six. Okay. Okay, so, um, so Tommy, does that kind of answer your question or at least give you an insight as four different parenting styles. That's perfect. I expect it to be a conclusion question. That's why I asked it like that, but that's absolutely perfect. And Josh, there you go. Okay, Josh, Josh, one more question from me. Um, Josh? Hello? Go ahead with your next question. Okay. So my next question is, at what age, as a parent, would you be comfortable um, knowing that your child is dating? And what age, preferably, would that be? Sorry, say that again. I didn't quite what, catch that. What, what, what um, age what? is appropriate for dating? Mm -hmm, basically. Dating. OK. Um, let me start with Mrs. Aremu with that. Never. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriate age to date. <laughs> ah. Ah. <laughs> Appropriate age. So my kids didn't date till, I don't know, maybe like 18 or, they were out of school, I think. I don't even think, it's, that's a hard one. Can All I right, take it? Can I take, it? take it from here. Yeah. Yeah, you take I, it. I, I have, was waiting I, for I, you I, to put I, your I, finger I, up. <laughs> I, I, I have I have I have boys and and I'm fine with them dating anytime they can take another person's feelings into account. 
um, um, right now in the world with the technology, everybody's so self-absorbed that they that they that they don't know they don't see the person coming in the supermarket door behind them. So if you walk in the door and you don't hold the door, you're probably not ready for dating. If you go to the supermarket and and your mother's going up to the cash register and you're standing there watching her scan all the items and pay the items and you're not trying to help, you're probably not ready for dating. So so the question is, it's not when it's not it's not what's the appropriate age is when is the person able to see, oh, wow, my mom is tired, but we have to go out grocery shopping. OK, I'll just tell her, listen, mom, you just drive us there and just stay in the car and I'll go in and I'll do the shopping. Oh, that person might be ready for dating. They might be ready for dating. Now, the second part of that is how are you going to date? Because you don't necessarily want to take me along, do you? You don't want me driving, do you? So then you've got to be able to drive. So that 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 involves a whole nother thing in terms of it. Now, you know, if you're getting together with a group, I don't know if you call that dating, but 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 the actual one on one romantic dating, that means that you have to have a car. That means that you have to be able to be responsible, a responsible driver. That means that the parents have to have the resources so that if you get too excited on the date, and you don't see that the lights red, that you crash the car and they're not put in upside down financial turmoil. So for a lot of parents, I think they say they don't want you dating. Some of this sex, yes, but some of this just, just, just assets. I don't have a car sitting outside for you to just go and drive around dating and and putting miles on and and quite possibly wrecking. So typically, nineteen and twenty is when it will begin because that's when you can get your own money, your own car, your own gas, and that's when at an age where you're probably ready to take into account somebody else's feelings. I know you want Ty, but she's got a peanut allergy. And they're not going to be able to scrape the peanuts off of the Thai. So you probably should go Italian. And if you're not ready, I'm not going Italian. I'm going Thai. You're probably not ready for dating. You know what, Attorney Lewis? I actually agree with you there. Oh, you see? <laughs> Elder I <do> too. <laughs> so um, as the father of daughters, to avoid any males, I said clearly to my daughters, um, well, no, let me stop. Josh, what is dating? Tell me what dating is. Ah, uh -oh. I saw you told me. I saw that body language. I saw it. What is dating? <laughs> I think what uh, Mr. Lewis said was a, a very good definition for me. Um, being able to account for someone else in a romantic way, I feel like being responsible enough to to a certain expect, a, aspect, take care of somebody. Obviously, you're not like their husband or, or spouse. So there, there's levels to it, of course. Great. Thank you, sir. So what I said to my daughters, and I say to them now, that don't date in, well, the, the ideal is not to date. Why waste your college time and your college money dating? Now, you can have male friends, and I make it very clear to them, use your male friends if you want to hang out with some friends and some males, it's okay to do that as long as you do it safely, but you're not in a relationship. You don't have the time. That's too much of your energy. That's too much of your emotion to be wasting your time. And unfortunately, this is where I'll probably get clicked off. I give them the statistics. The last statistics I read said four African-American males into college the first year, four African-American females into college the first year. After Christmas break, four African-American females come back to college, three African-American males come back to college. After the first year of college, two African-American males come back to college, three African-American females come back to college. At the end of four years, one African-American male graduate college. That's a waste of your time. And I say to them, listen, they can be your friends, you can hang out, no relationship. We don't have time for that. Relationship is too emotionally involved. It drain, drains you, drags you down. That's Team Peter, but Team Lewis is welcome to join in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from, from my perspective, honestly, yes, I feel when it comes to relationships as a whole, I feel like in, in college, 
I think there, to an extent, there is an importance of relationships in, in that kind of way, because it, to me, it sets, it's, it allows you to to know what you want for yourself in, mm. uh, in like a, a marriage standpoint. It sees you, you learn what you want from a person, what attracts you to a person, and vice versa, what you don't want in a, a significant other. So. I, I definitely understand both with what you said, Mr. Richard. Yeah, and, and for for me, I want you to I want you to date in college. I want you mm-hmm. I, I, I want you I want you to, I want you to date in college, but I want you to be clear on what you're doing in college. You didn't go to college mm-hmm. to date. What's your goal? My goal is to be an engineer. You can date while you do that, um, but but again, we're not dating a bunch of people. You see somebody, you're interested, you ask him out for dinner, you spend some time with them, you know. But but and that's mm-hmm. just just a get together. You know, dating is when I'm very interested in you. And, you know, when you're ready for that, you'll know. Very true. And some people are ready for it at 15. Yeah, m- most aren't, but some people are. All right. Um, Dr. Ngozi had to drop off. I already told oh. you before she's in the hospital, so I'm going to take <laughs> over. <laughs> I guess she she had a call. So, um, Josh, is your question answered? Okay. So, um, let me read uh, what um, somebody said in the chat, and I've asked her to uh, I've asked Lisa to put her opinion in the chat. She said um, her her style is different from what all the panelists have said. So I've asked her to go ahead and put her opinion in the chat, and then I want to read out. Um, um, what, um, yes, Pastor Tola, you said, as parents, we should continuously have this dialogue with our children and set boundaries. And I think that is absolutely important. Um, not having conversations and not setting boundaries, in my opinion, is what gets them in trouble because then they want to sneak around you and do stuff. Whereas if you sit them down and ask the kind of questions that uh, Mr. Lewis asked and ask the kind of questions or make the kind of uh, projections that uh, Elder Peter said, then they can think and wait and say, okay, my parents are not just saying no. They are helping me think through this. Like, that's what I tell parents. Don't just say no to everything that your child does or that your child is asking to do. Think through it for them and then maybe give them alternative rather than just everything is no. Like Tommy said at the beginning, we already know you're going to say no. At some point, they're going to get married anyway. So do you want them to just bring the guy a month to the wedding or two weeks to the wedding, somebody they barely know, do you want them to have had opportunities? And now I'm not saying go crazy and date every person because I, I like I tell my children, if for every broken relationship that you have, a part of you goes away with that person and it dumps some baggage in your mind, in your spirit okay. as well. So yes. we really have to be careful, you know, guide them to making the right choices, ask them the right questions, help them think through it. What's my goal? And then when I start, what are the boundaries I'm setting for myself? What kind of standards am I going to hold this person to? And what kind of standards do I want to be held into, held up to? I think that's, um, you know, a good way to have a conversation with them. Can, 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 can I can, can I say one thing? That Josh, when you start talking about dating, um, are, if if you if you're 15, you're, you're like a nickel. And at, at 18, maybe you're a dime, and at 25, maybe you're a quarter. So, so like when you go into the world at 19 and you start dating, are you looking for a quarter when you're only a dime, or have you developed yourself all the way to be a quarter and you're looking for another quarter or a 50 cent piece? Like, so, so for me, it like I met my wife. I think I was 19 or 20. I was in college. I was working on me, and I was continuing to work on me, and she crossed my path. I wasn't really looking at dating so much as just working on me. And I think if you work on you, um, sometimes people become attracted to you, you become attracted to other people. But if, if you're 14 and you're trying to date, you're only worth a nickel. So I don't, I don't understand right. how you're gonna date a 50 cents piece when you're only a nickel. And two nickels uh, probably won't be able to buy much. You and her together, two nickels. You, you, you can't do much with two nickels. Yeah, so you have to develop yourself and she's not going to be a quarter and you're a nickel. That's not going to happen. So you've got to develop yourself in order to attract somebody that you're going to that, that you're going to be able to sustain a relationship with. I, I definitely agree. I feel like that's a, that's a, like okay. a very good answer. Next question. Let's, let's keep this rolling. Maybe two or three more and then we'll start to wrap up. I'm going to let Josh ask the next question just because um, it ties in with what's already been said. 
Oh, okay. So next question is, um, as parents, would you want to be involved in your child's dating process? Or do you want to see the, or do you just want to see the person that they end up getting married to? So are you a parent that's going to critique the, the person that they bring home or say, oh, you can't be with this person? Or what are your opinions? <laughs> Can, can, let, 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 me, let me take a little piece of this. First of all, I don't want to know, I don't want to have to learn a lot of names. So I want you to bring <laughs> the one you serious about. I don't, oh, that's Susie. And that's, I'm not good with names. So you need to bring the one. But, but that being said, my, my youngest likes to, likes to tell his mother about how old she is. So he knows when he brings his girlfriend, we're going to have a critique fest. Is that her real nose? Look at her ear. Look at her. Yeah, yeah, because he does it with his mother. So it has to be okay. You see, mm -hmm. <laughs> you see if you, if, listen, your mother's, your mother's 55. I didn't meet her at 55. I met her at 20. She was hot then. We're talking about, we're talking about you bringing home a 20-year-old. She better look better than your mother. No, I want them to give me just, I want them to bring the person that they're serious about. I don't need to be involved in the process because all I want to do is be involved with helping you become the best you you want to become. You're not going to be my, 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 my children are named junior because I don't expect my children to be me. I tell my boys all the time, you have to become your own man, figure out what type of man you want to be. Josh, you might want to be the type of man where you and your wife both work and you divide up all of the bills in the house. Like when my brother first said that, I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me because if I go over to your house and I can't, and I turn the light on and it doesn't come on, I'm never gonna look at your wife, I'm gonna look at you. So I'm built a little bit different. I, I it, it doesn't matter if my wife's making twice, twice my salary, I still feel like I'm responsible as the head of the household to make sure things are paid. You have to determine what type of man you're gonna be in your household. And then you have to find a woman that is gonna be okay with that if you're gonna have a serious relationship. Because if, if you think, okay, we're gonna split the bills and she thinks, okay, I'm gonna stay home after we have children, there's gonna be a disconnect and I can't help you with that disconnect because I'm not, I'm not gonna be out there holding your hand looking for this woman. You know, you have to figure out who you are, attract the type of woman to yourself that, that will complement who you are, and then you've got to build your life together. I'll be over here. You can call me. You can call me, but no, I'm not going to help you. No, I'm not going to help you date. Thank you. So, Josh and Tommy, I think you, you, you can um, put together the, the answers for that particular question. You have to be matured enough. You have to be responsible you have to, you know, there's a difference between group dating and when you start zoning into one person, you have to be serious. You have to be sure that this is the person and then you want to go ahead with it. I have a comment here from one of the parents, Pastor Tola, she said, um, I tell my children I'm not ready to meet different people, but when they know it's heading somewhere with a testimony, then we can talk about it. So I hope that helps you. You know, we, we parents, we don't want to know five people over a period of two years. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and then you again, like Louis said, you, you want to be able to take the person out on your own money, not on daddy's money or mommy's money. You have a car, you have, you know, you have meaningful things that you want to do, not just I want to be sane with this person, or I want to be cool because everybody else on campus has a boyfriend, or everybody else in high school has a boyfriend or has a girlfriend. I hope that's that's clear. Um, okay, Tommy, you have something because we all have different parenting styles. I would really like to hear another parent's answer to this question. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. They are, you want, you mean from the audience or from No. Oh, sorry. From the panel. From the panel. Okay. Miss Arema. Mrs. Arema. You're on mute. And I think I'm going to ask. Okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You want us to answer the same question about the dating? She said she wants a different opinion. About the dating? curious to see whether we have um, whether you as parents all have the same opinion of I don't want to meet many people I just want to know what's going on okay. I'm, I have the same opinion okay. I don't have Thank time you. to go through a process of elimination with you okay it's so okay since one. you have I have somebody in the audience that's been asking to speak since okay. your opinion is the same with the other panelists let me give her a chance I hope I'm not throwing myself into trouble if other people start to ask we really have to start wrapping on Miss Lisa Thomas please go ahead Unmute yourself and go ahead. One minute. Okay, so real quick, I just feel like um, my opinion is a little bit different because I have I have seven kids, ages ranging from twenty to four, 
and I have six boys. And um, currently my 13 year old, he has a little friend or whatever, and we're okay with that. Um, I feel like if you wanna experience different dating life, like if you wanna have different um, girlfriends in your life, that's fine with me. I'm okay with that. It doesn't bother me. My daughter, however, she's 17. She's never dated. She's never dated. She's never done anything but focus on school. Maybe that's just her thing or whatever. But if she chose to start dating at 15, I'm okay with that. Okay. Because can I, I ask you a question real quick because of time at 15? What do you think or what do you understand your son's um, opinion or what do you think your, your, your son understands as dating? What so are the try- boundaries for him? Does he have boundaries? Do you have boundaries for him? All my children have boundaries. And he knows that there's, you can't go out here having sex and stuff like that. But I'm also a realist and so is my husband. And we let them know that things do happen and things will happen. I can't, I'm not a helicopter parent. So I can't monitor your every move. And if you're over in another neighborhood hanging out with your friends and your girlfriend or whatever she is, is over there, something happens. I just expect you to be open and honest with me and let me know what happened. And that way I got your back and I can take care of, you know, I can help you get through the situation. So there's always boundaries, but as a kid, I don't expect them to fully stick to those boundaries either. Okay, thank you. Thank Next you for question. letting me share that. I, if I can give a feedback on that. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Excellent. Um, and Lisa's someone I've known since she was a teenager. So I've had the privilege of being her mentor and now being a friend as adults and raising children. So what I tell my girls, um, no, I don't. If you're bringing a guy home, be sure who you're bringing home. Make sure you've prepared him for who you're bringing him home to. I will absolutely clown you if you bring the wrong thing home. Amen, hallelujah. Amen. So if you- Oh yeah. Okay, are you done? Yes. I wanted to give somebody else in the audience an opportunity. Pastor Talaoye, please respond. Pastor Tola, please unmute yourself and respond. Sorry, what was, I didn't, what was the question? Um, the issue of allowing her, her son at age 13 to date. I personally, my opinion is different because at 13, the child should be much more focused on the child's education, not dating. Dating is a distraction, whether we like it or not. So that's why I said for somebody to date, it has to be in college and the child has to be matured and the parents should have had the dialogue with the child to set the boundaries on what dating is. Because to be honest with you, most times our children, they become vulnerable because they don't know what's going on. Because as Christian parents, we try not to have that discussion about dating with them, which we should be doing so that they can have boundaries and they can know that it's not, it's not just anybody that they see that says, I love you that they have to follow that person. So I believe that, I mean, for my children, I have um, older children, they're 30. And I know that the way we, myself and my husband, we raised them was that dating is not a priority. It's education, after education and you're good, you're successful, then dating can come in. So I still still believe in that kind of principle. God will help us all in Jesus' name. Amen, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to read two or three questions from the anonymous questions that we got. Some of them have already been handled in the course of um, the questions that Tommy and uh, Josh were asking. And I'm going to run through them. I will ask each one of you to pick one. So one says, why do African parents find it so difficult to take their time to understand their teenager? Why that teenager is doing something instead of jumping into conclusions whenever the child does something wrong. So here is it, your child does something wrong you think it's okay, you know it's wrong. So, but the, the teenager feels like you didn't, you're not even asking them, you know, about, okay, why did you do this? You know, and all of that, you just jump into conclusions. Oh, I know why you did this or this or that, you know? So that's one question. Number two question, why do you say that you love us and will do anything for us, but yet you don't allow us to do things that make us happy. You only want to, us to do what you want us to do. Is there any actual sense in that? Number three, why do you not allow us freedom of our own even after age 18? Three questions, um, three panelists. Let's go. <laughs> let, let, me, let, me take, let, me take, let me take number three. 
um, um, when, when you start to, when you start talking about when you start talking about freedom, as long as you expect your parents to pay the bills, your parents are going to have some say in what's going on because it ultimately affects their energy and their and their pocketbook. So it's difficult for you to, if you're 26 years old and you still need your mother to make your car payment she's still gonna be asking questions about your career. So if you wanna be free, the best way to be free is to be independent. Crush high school, go to college on a full scholarship. Your parents don't have to say anything to you. You're there, you've got a full scholarship, you got, they paying, they paying your housing and they're giving you a stipend. Your parents may not say very Mr. much. Mr. Louis, then. hold on, I'm a Nigerian parent. Even with a full scholarship, and you have everything together, we're still going to have questions. Okay. So help us okay. under no 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 help us understand that. Should we be doing that? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's, it's not a question, it's not a question of should. Some some parents some it, listen, parents have been with their children for a long time. And so the parents may still have questions. He, uh, some of the children create drama for themselves. Go to school and deal with eight different teachers and show your parents that you can handle any kind of teacher, an authoritarian teacher, a permissive teacher, go crush your grades. See, when you crush your grades, it means that no matter what comes, I can double down and I can handle it. And as your parents start to see that, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, freshman year in high school, a freshman year in college, they will become less and less involved in your life. You got to see in English, you've been speaking English your whole life. You got to see in African history, and that's all that your, your family's talking about. You got to see in Spanish, you've been speaking Spanish your whole life. Your parents are going to be very involved with your life because your job is school and you're not doing very well at your job. The be Listen, my, my father didn't have much to say. He came to orientation for high school and for graduation. Hmm. And my father really didn't say much after that because I was handling my business. <laughs> I was doing, he, he was paying for school, I was going to school and I was handling my business. And when it came time to go out on Friday, he didn't have a bunch to say about that because he knew whatever he's going out there doing, he's not gonna mess up his grades. Whoever he's out there dating, he's not gonna mess up these grades. He's not gonna work for this 3.8 and, th and then get some little raggedy girl pregnant because that would that would undo the, all of the 3.8. It doesn't make it, he's not gonna work this hard for the grades and then smoke marijuana. That doesn't make any sense. But if you got a 2.8 GPA or 2.9 GPA, what you're telling your parents is, you can expect almost any foolishness from me. Okay. Any sort of foolishness might come. Thank you, Anthony. Let me go to the next person so we can, um, <laughs> We can cover the other two questions and then I'll go, I would allow Josh and Tommy after the last two questions, I would allow them to ask one thing or comment or make a, a closing statement. Okay, so the next question, who wants to take that? Let me read that. Why do most parents always say that they love us and will do anything for us, but they don't allow us to do things that make us happy? They only do what they think is best for them or what is best for us. Who is taking that? Well, so I could take that one. Um, I think one of the things that I can come in from a Nigerian parent perspective, right? So we live here. I was born in England. I live in the States, but I'm a Nigerian. We say we love our children. We love our children dearly. We'll do anything for our children. You have to remember that. And you have to remember that our background is always we're Nigerians. And so respect is important, regardless of what we do. And so whatever decision we make, you have to believe that your parents love you first. And so we're not gonna do anything to harm you regardless of what you think is going on or whatever. So whatever decision we make, has, you have to believe it's in your best interest regardless of what you think. And so um, I, it, that's just it really plain and simple. Like we had said earlier on, there's always dialogue. There's always should be, I think there should be an open continuous effort and dialogue. I think dialogue is key. Let's just talk about it. But I feel like, coming back at your parents to say, they say they love you, but they don't love you because they're not letting you do what you want to do. I don't think that's a fair statement. I don't believe your parents will say they love you and not love you because they're not letting you do what you want to do. I think you should sit back and think about what you're trying to do and why are they asking you not to do it? And then come back and just talk about that and analyze it from your perspective. 
I think that would be a better way to go about it rather than just drawing the line down the sand. And that's how I talk to my children about it. And I remember I would talk to my daughter. If she's having like a really bad day, she's like, oh, I, say, I say, if you don't even love your parents, you even like us, you know, like us today. And then tomorrow we'll talk about the love. But you don't like us today. Um, and, and, just, and just go from there. Because at the end of the day, we're your parents. Our parenting might be different from what your friends tell you in their school. When you go to school, we're Nigerian. It's different. I get it. But there's always an in-between. We can always find a balance in between and know that it's different. And, and go from there. But through it all, I think it's important. We will respect you as your children, as our children, but we expect that respect from you back. And as you get older, it's different levels of respect, right? The way I talked to my daughter when she was five is not the way I talk to her now that she's 27, but I feel like the respect should always be there. And, and it's important that you remember that as well. Thank you. Um, Elder Peter, the third question. Why do parents find it so difficult to take time to understand why their teenager does something instead of jumping to conclusions anytime a child does something wrong? So there was a different answer I would give prior to the COVID. At COVID, I changed my, my tactic or I changed my status that COVID mm -hmm. taught me there's some things that's just not that important. And I went into the COVID saying, I am not fussing about anything. We will sit down, we will talk, or mm -hmm. I'll go and do a wusa if I have to. But it's not worth the energy, the time, and the emotional drain during this COVID for things that were just a three or four on a level of a 10. Um, so my answer is very different now. And now I am wanting to take the time and say, you know, what's going on? Tell me what's going on in your head. And to the extent, that even if there's no answer, because remember I have one that don't talk to me or the other one that you know gives me her opinion her way and I'll get no answer, but I'll come back and visit it. Then I learned this secret. I was like, oh, why didn't anybody remind me? Use my device, <laughs> text them. <laughs> to piss them off more, I'll go on your social media. Oh, wow, your kids let you follow them? My kids don't let me follow them. Well, they're adults, they're not kids. They don't let me follow them on social media. They've not allowed so me to. Auntie. Remember, uh, Elder Peter, you remember you and I talked about that like five yeah. years ago? Yeah, I forgot about it, but okay. Auntie, here's the reality of it. So um, you didn't tell me that they're going to have multiple accounts, Tony, <laughs> Josh. That's work. That is extreme work, multiple accounts. Then you didn't tell me, y'all made me jump there, that they share accounts <laughs> so that their friends have access to their account. So while I'm choking out my daughter for profanity, it wasn't her post. It was her friend's post, Lord help me today. So as a result, um, I've just learned to just, you know, we're working through this. And they, they know dad is having some, some, emotional challenges during this season. And so I'm like, hey, work with me. And it's a joke, but it's probably in a bad taste joke. And I said, I'm sorry, I responded before I took my medication this morning. Give me a moment, <laughs> let me take it, let it kick in. Can we come back and visit this? And I do apologize and just say, I didn't handle that right. You know, I didn't handle that right. I wanna commend Tommy, thank you. Josh, thank you, you guys took on, first of all, Nigerian parents. Nigerian have mercy on your <laughs> <laughs> then Nigerian I turned parents. to Lewis. And then you had this crazy one too. from Miami, Florida. Thank you guys. It's been fun. It's been real. And I hope it helped a lot. Thank you. And I want to piggyback on that as well. I think it's been fun. And it was funny, you know, talking about the whole generation gap. So I'll tell you a quick funny story. I was feeling really cool today because I had to do an Instagram live. And I'd never done one before. And my son was home and he said, do you need help? And I said, no, I said, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so I sat down here and I was about to get started and I set up and everything. And he came downstairs and he said, are you starting? And I said, yeah. He said, mom, you, you can't do an Instagram live on your laptop. You need your phone. I thought you'd do it on your laptop. <laughs> Apparently you can only do it on a phone. But anyway, that was me trying to be cool. He said, nah, you need your phone. But anyway, it's been fun. I, I think, um, I hope you learned a little something. I hope it helped. Um, and um, if we were doing it again, I will, 
you know, just let me know and um, we'll, we'll do it again. But you, you, you did well, took on some Nigerian parents, came back at us with your questions. And, and some, to take on somebody like Anthony Lewis, oh my goodness. Let me tell you. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, Josh, um, tell me who wants to go first. Your closing you comment. First. Okay. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for coming and thank you for the panel of uh, parents. And I just want to say one thing that I've learned, even though all parents have very different parenting styles, I think what I've gotten from this is that you guys all circle around the same thing. You want your kids to know your priorities and like have them set them straight about that. And it's like, once they know your priorities, then all the questions of, oh, should we do this? Should we do that? They will know it themselves because they know what your role in life is. And I thank you guys for letting me understand that. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And um, let me wrap up and say, we want, to, we want you to understand our priorities, but we want to understand your priorities. So if you, and I know these questions are not really you know, specific to either of you, to anyone, to any of our youths that is on this call today, our goal is to have the best for you. And if we are not doing a good job of it and you don't think we are coming across that way, like every of the parent here today has said, you can start a meaningful conversation with us. Just don't be disrespectful. Don't shame your parents. Find a good time, you know, when they're in a good mood and say, Daddy, can I talk with you? Mommy, can I talk with you? and be respectful about it. Ask them questions, but don't ask in a defiant way. Don't ask in a way that you know, comes across with your body language, like you want to pitch a fight, like, why do you do this? Why do you do that? No, you're going to get into trouble. So ask questions. Even if your parents are not normally the conversational type, you can start it, but you can start it respectfully. You can create a new culture around your home respectfully. Hey, mommy, this would, is what I would rather have. Maybe your mom doesn't understand this or your daddy doesn't understand that. Hey, daddy, how about this? My kids have said things like that to me before. And they say, oh, mommy, you are different now. You were not like this when we were growing up. And I say, yes, I wasn't because I didn't know better at that time. Now I know better, you know, but even at that time, I give them permission to ask questions with one very strong, one very strict, strict instruction. Do not call me out outside. You can call me out at home. Say that again. Call Say me that out again. outside. Excuse Back. me? What did you say, Elder? I said, say it again. And yes. hashtag facts. <laughs> yes. Don't do me. Do not in public. Do not. Not in public. Yes. Ask your questions at home. You know? Yes. You want to point out something that your parents are doing wrong, that it's upsetting you, that you think it's affecting the way you even relate to people. You know, like some parents still feel like don't talk to an adult if you are not being talked to. That's not right. But outside is not when to call them out. You can talk to them inside. So I hope, you know, you have learned a few things here. I hope um, you understand where we're coming from, whether we're African or we're African-American or we're even white. It doesn't matter. Our goal is your best interest. We want to see you out, turn out well. We want to see you, you know, prepared for the road. We want to prepare you for the road, but we, you know, we want you, we want to prepare the road for you, but we want to prepare you for the road. We want to make sure you are well-rounded, you are balanced. You can tackle life's issues on your own and, you know, be good at it, succeed all around success, mentally, academically, emotionally, spiritually. We want to see you thrive. T-H-R-I-V-E. And whatever we do in our best times and our worst times, that's our goal. We want to see you thrive. I hope everyone uh, of our participants, you have come up or you have, uh, you have uh, come to learn or pick one or two things from this conversation. We hope to see you some other time. Um, when we invite you, you can, um, uh, if you want to get information from us, for those of you who joined, um, not registering, we don't have your information, but you can text join PRI to 24251. It's in the chat. Text join PRI to 24251 so that we can send you information like some of questions that we couldn't get to, or even some of these ones that we would like to collate the answers and send out to you. We are always here for you. Feel free to reach out to us. You can also reach out if you would like to reach out to any of the panelists. We'll be glad to connect you with them if you would like to 
you know, engage them, you know, one-on-one on one outside of this. I want to say a very big thank you to all of them, Elder Peter, Attorney Lewis, Mrs. Nikki Aremo, Dr. Ngozi. Thank you, everyone. We wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Merry holiday. Christmas. I want to thank all my uh, PRI volunteers. You are awesome. God bless you all. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll Take see care. you in 2021 by the grace of God. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.